Good afternoon. So who am I and why am I here? I am Neil Siegel and I am here because by the power invested in no one and nothing, I have declared myself Duke University's Constitution Day Compliance Officer. Now why, you might ask, does the university require a Constitution Day Compliance Officer? Well, it's because of an amendment that Senator Robert Byrd attached to a spending bill back in 2004 that created Constitution Day. Uh, and this statute uh, provides uh, that every educational institution that receives federal funds shall hold an educational program on the Constitution on Constitution Day uh, and further provides uh, that September 17th shall be that day, the day in which the framers in Philadelphia in that hot summer of 1787 signed uh, the document that they had produced. Uh, that's what they did with their summer vacations. Uh, so uh, Senator Byrd's action uh, and Congress's approval of it suggests that uh, Congress thinks it's very important uh, for Americans to take their Constitution very seriously. And I thought that it might be uh, informative and maybe fun uh, to ask the question uh, whether Congress itself takes the Constitution seriously, both historically and today. What does it mean to take the Constitution seriously? And has Congress's relationship to the Constitution changed over time? I have with me uh, two, uh, two people who are very well qualified to address this question. Uh, my colleague Chris Schrader here at Duke Law School uh, and our friend Michael Gerhardt at UNC Law School. Both are prominent constitutional scholars and both have extensive experience working in the Senate, including on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And we'll begin with Professor Schrader. Uh, we'll turn to Professor Gerhardt. I'll uh, add in uh, a few thoughts of my own and then we'll turn it over to you folks for your questions and comments. Professor Schrader. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to stand up just because I've been sitting all morning. Uh, I suppose on Constitution Day, uh, ordained by the Congress, it's totally fair to turn the lens around and ask, of the Congress, whether or not they should be having a Constitution Day to educate themselves about the document. I think there is a popular perception that the Constitution is um, honored when it's useful to be honored and ignored when it's useful to be ignored by members of Congress at different points in time. Let me give you just three perspectives or approaches that I think you can see members of Congress taking towards the Constitution. And I want to, I'm going to focus on the member level instead of the institutional level, uh, but the institutional responses are something we could well discuss uh, as the hour continues. So to state the obvious, members of Congress aren't judges. Uh, probably, thank God for that, many of them aren't even lawyers, which wouldn't disqualify you from being a Supreme Court justice, but would disqualify you from being uh, lower court judges in and, and in many states. Uh, so maybe we're better off if the members of Congress are not spending a whole lot of time worrying about something uh, about which they haven't uh, thought very hard uh, or consistently. But as I've looked at members' behavior, again, three different approaches I think you can see if you watch members of Congress when they're engaging uh, constitutional issues. I'll illustrate one by giving you a story of an early experience of mine when was, I was working in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice in the Clinton administration. And, and early on, I went to a meeting of representatives of about 15 different agencies or branches of the Executive Office of the President to discuss how to implement a piece of legislation. Prior to the meeting, uh, three options had been circulated as to different regulatory approaches the lead agency might take towards this, implementing this law. And we at the Office of Legal Counsel take it as one of our jobs to analyze both the constitutionality and the statutory um, legality of regulatory proposals. 
And we had come to the conclusion that two of the proposals that were being advanced were illegal. That is, they weren't consistent with the statute. And one of them was probably also unconstitutional. I went to this meeting. The, the, it was chaired by a very senior member of the Office of Management and Budget. He went around the table asking for input from the participants, and he got various views on which of the three options were superior. By the time it got to me, I was about in the middle of the group. Uh, it was apparent that one option was going to be greatly preferred, perhaps nearly unanimously preferred with a dissent or two. And one option was going to be um, thought to be woefully inferior. And then there was a third, third option in the middle that was kind of the Goldilocks option. And I, uh, my remarks were limited not, I didn't address the policy merits of one proposal or another at all. I just explained why, in the view of the people at the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice, the most favored option and the middle option were illegal. And the most favored option was unconstitutional. At this point, I thought, uh, and end of meeting. I've just blown up this meeting because uh, there's nothing more to discuss. It was completely apparent that the third option wasn't preferred by anybody. And we needed to go back to the drawing board. The, the senior official from the Office of Management and Budget said to me, uh, thank you for those remarks, Mr. Schrader. We'll take them under consideration. And then turned to the person next to me and asked what their policy preferences were for the three options. So. Lawyers think that legality and especially constitutionality ought to be side constraints on policy. Once, if, it's, if it's across the constitutional line, end of discussion. The policy options have to all be uh, developed within the sphere of, uh, of discretion that, that uh, meet constitutional and statutory tests. At this meeting, it was quite clear that my views on the legality and constitutionality were being taken in, but they were being taken in as one merely one consideration among many that would weigh in the overall balance of how the outcome uh, eventually came to be. As it turned out, um, the administration actually implemented one of those two options that I had advised them was illegal. Three years after they did so, a court agreed with me. Uh, they might have disagreed, but they, in this case, they did agree. I think that's a illustration of the way lots of members uh, from time to time view constitutional claims or objections that are being made about legislation that's pending. It's one of a number of considerations. They're not ignoring it, but they don't treat it as a side constraint to their discussion, but, but rather a factor that flows into a kind of all things considered judgment about whether something is worth going ahead or not. There may be some perfectly good explanations for this. As they say, pe people in Congress are not they do not tend to be constitutional experts. Many of them aren't law trained at all. The constitutional questions that are frequently raised are tough. People can disagree. Um, we could have debated the constitutionality of the um, private mandate in the Affordable Care Act, as I think Professor Siegel is going to talk about some, for a long time in Congress. And what we would have found is a very hotly divided Congress, just as we found eventually a pretty significantly split uh, Supreme Court. So you might say, you know, well, um, they're doing as, as good as they can. And unless the constitutional objection is just slams you in the face and no one would deny that it's there, uh, perhaps it's um, the better part of wisdom for members to fold that into their analysis and at the same time, think about other considerations that uh, bear on their mind when they're, when they're uh, deciding to vote for or against some measure. And that's the way I think a lot of them do treat constitutional arguments. As a second perspective that is different from this one, and this is when you have a suspicion listening to somebody raising a constitutional claim that the claim is self-serving and opportunistically formulated. It's always wonderful to have a policy proposal um, or let's take opposing a policy proposal, not only to think it's a bad idea, but to be able to claim that it's unconstitutional as well. Or on the other hand, to have a policy a, idea of your own and assert that you have to pass it this way because anything else would be unconstitutional. 
And there's a sus suspicion that people have, and rightly so, given the degree of skepticism we have about members of Congress, which is coming first. Are you making up your policy mind first and then constructing a constitutional argument to defend it, or, or vice versa? I'll give you an example. Last year, the majority leader of the Senate, through a parliamentary maneuver, changed the filibuster rule as it applies to judicial nominations so that now a filibuster on a nomination of an appellate court judge only takes 51 votes to defeat, or to, to call for cloture so that the debate ends, whereas on legislation, 60 votes are required. This has sometimes been referred to as the nuclear option available to the Senate to change the filibuster rule through a parliamentary maneuver. And it was called the nuclear option because people who were opposed to it said, it will destroy the Senate. The, 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 the Senate will become paralyzed in vitriol and, and uh, recriminations by the people who are being denied minority rights in the Senate by having their filibuster protection winnowed down as it applies to judges. Well, the nuclear option was not an invention of Harry Reid. It was actually much discussed by a Republican-controlled Senate when George Bush was president, when the advocates of it at that time regularly referred to it as the constitutional option. And they referred to it as the constitutional option because they had a constitutional argument that the Constitution requires the Senate to take a vote on anybody the, the president nominates for the judiciary. So that a filibuster rule which would prevent an up or down vote on the nominee was unconstitutional. That was the constitutional argument. The Republicans uh, controlled Senate for reasons that aren't important today, decided not to go ahead with the nuclear option, and therefore it was still a debating point between the uh, two parties when the majority leader exercised his uh, authority to arrange for the parliamentary maneuver just last year. As the maneuvering was occurring in the democratically controlled Senate, you might have thought that Republican members who thought that this was constitutionally required would be storming down to the floor of the Senate to applaud the measure that Harry Reid was about to impose on them, because finally we were bringing Senate procedure in compliance with their views of the Constitution. You did not hear such <laughs> claims of support from uh, Republican senators who eight years earlier had defended the maneuver on the basis of constitutional mandate. Don't know. Um, I won't go into the full story behind why uh, Senator Reid made this maneuver now, uh, but it's occasions like that, that is to say people wrap, uh, wrap positions that they support in the flag or in the Constitution when it's in to their benefit of doing so, but are relatively silent when you would think if they were being consistent and principled, they should be just as um, uh, supportive or laudatory of the action when the shoe is on the other foot, that makes people somewhat suspicious of what's the cart and what's the horse when members are um, raising constitutional issues. So the third approach, the third perspective that you can see in Congress is just the flip of that. I think it's fair to say that members do take the Constitution seriously from time to time um, and are very concerned about the meets and bounds of constitutional controls. Um, war powers debates come up all the time on the floor of the Senate and the House. And again, it's hard to, it is hard to distinguish between the self-serving constitutional argument, you're against the President's action going, ramping up the uh, bombing efforts against ISIS, and so one of the arguments you make is it's beyond his constitutional authority to do that unless he gets a vote. You're for the president's initiative. You're much more inclined to um, link, those, link that approval of the action with a constitutional argument that supports it. But the fact that it's hard to distinguish the two postures doesn't mean, I think, that the sincerely held commitment to constitutional views uh, doesn't exist. Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, has been concerned for years about, on the basis of background intelligence briefings that he could not disclose in public, that the NSA was exceeding 
constitutional and statutory authorities in the surveillance that it was that it has, has been undertaking and that were some of which have been revealed by Ed Snowden in uh, and the Guardian um, and the Washington Post in lots of releases since Mr. Snowden Snow stole a lot of uh, classified documents from the NSA. Senator Wyden was, was beating the drums in the background with the administration for several years during a period of time when he couldn't make any political mileage out of it because he couldn't disclose it in public. And he was terribly frustrated by his lack of any getting any attention in uh, the executive branch as long as the information had not been made public. I think, I can't show you dispositive evidence of this, but I think that Senator Wyden had a sincerely held view of what the Fourth Amendment requires that he saw being transgressed by the NSA programs. Now, it's also true, and again, the reason, another illustration of the reason why it's difficult to distinguish these second and third cases, then Ron Wyden, I think, would object to the overreach of the NSA, even if it weren't unconstitutional. He, he is more of a civil libertarian than uh, the data gatherers in the National Security Agency, and he wants more personal protections provided to our personal data and our communications, whether or not the Constitution goes that far. So these second and third cases are difficult to distinguish. And in general, the reason is that, well, I'll put it the other way around. You have a difficult time finding occasions in which a member of Congress will stand up and state a constitutional view that stands in the way of something that he, would, he or she would otherwise want to do. Almost all of the statements you will hear from members those two things will be in incongruence, their policy preferences and their constitutional arguments. One reason for that, and the point on which I will conclude, is not only aren't members judges, but the Congress isn't a court. So members get to pick and choose when they articulate views on lots of issues. And it's, it's uh, I suppose it's a part of human nature. It runs, if it runs against your self-interest in terms of your policy preferences, to state that you think the Constitution prevents this policy preference from being implemented, you're less inclined to hear that speech than you are a speech in which the member is embracing the Constitution and saying that the policy that uh, he or she is, is opposing either thwarts the, uh, is constitutionally impermissible if they're opposing it or is constitutionally permittable, permissible if they are supporting it. So the two cases are difficult to tear apart, these second and third cases. But I think at a member basis, they, they, they do exist. And uh, it's important, I think, when you're looking at individual members of Congress and their behavior with respect to constitutional arguments, to keep that in mind. Thank you, Professor Schrader. Uh, we'll hear now from Professor Gerhardt. Well, th <clears throat> thank you, Neil. Uh, and I just want to take a moment at the outset to um, just tell all of you how lucky you are. You've got two of the best people I know of. In fact, I think literally two of the most thoughtful constitutional scholars and teachers you could have sitting over here. Um, so I'm really honored to be a part of their program, especially honored because as I was <clears throat> thinking about what I would say today, is the image that kept popping into my head was an image that came to me from my friend Mike Paulson, who I debated years ago here on the filibuster, and Mike Paulson is a conservative constitutional scholar, a very principled guy, who once said upon being introduced at Yale um, at a conference um, that he likened himself to a, to a skunk at a garden party. Um, I should tell you, I have a slightly higher opinion of myself than Mike has of himself, uh, but I do come to you as a Tar Heel who is very grateful for lunch. Um, <laughs> and very grateful for the reception that I always get here, which is uh, completely cordial and very nice. And we would like to think we would reciprocate completely. So um, that's just saying, a long way of saying, don't be too hard on us this year. Um, anyway, um, it's going to happen anyway. Um, but uh, as I think about the topic, um, I also want to um, add a couple things to what Chris suggested. In fact, let me make my charge a little harder at the outset. Um, the question, of course, we're considering is whether members of Congress take the Constitution seriously. And I know 
that a lot of people think the answer to that is obvious, and they think that obvious answer is no. Um, just so happened that a few weeks ago, I finished uh, helping to edit the last, or the most recent edition of a case book on legislative process. Um, one of my co-editors is the great Judge Abner Mikva, who at one time was a member of Congress, and later, of course, a judge, and later, of course, the chief counsel to the President of the United States, among many other distinctions in his career. And it might interest you to know what Judge Mikva thinks of that topic. In 1983, Judge Mikva wrote an article in the North Carolina Law Review about why he thought that members of Congress didn't do a good job interpreting the Constitution. Uh, he, he cited all sorts of reasons why, and of course he had reason to know himself from his own experience. Among them was the lack of time, lack of sophistication, lack of legal training, sometimes lack of interest, sometimes some of the points Chris made, which is they have tremendous incentives to do things in their self-interest, and none of that made their constitutional deliberation trustworthy. And that comes from a former member of Congress. And that, by the way, was over 30 years ago. So imagine what he must think now. I've, I, I could probably tell you what he thinks now. It's not any better. Um, and we all know what we think about Congress. So the question becomes, why would we not gravitate towards that obvious answer? And I actually want to give you a few things to think about uh, for, for reasons um, to resist that obvious answer. Um, the first one is we need to think about what criteria we would use to assess the quality of constitutional deliberation in Congress. It's very hard to come up with criteria we'd all agree on. More often than not, people tend to look at the outcomes and decide whether or not they agree with them. I can probably tell you, after a couple years of law school, you might not want to opt for that one necessarily. Um, there are other reasons to think about perhaps why we should uh, use certain criteria, more neutral criteria, for assessing the quality of constitutional deliberation. Um, but without that kind of criteria, we, we find ourselves in a bit of a dilemma. So uh, we'd also uh, be tempted to liken members of Congress to judges, but as Chris just pointed out, I think quite correctly, and I of course agree, they're not members of the judiciary. Uh, they're not going to function like judges. Uh, and for that matter, they're not going to function like people in the executive branch either. Um, and one of the things we encounter as we look at how all those three branches interact over questions of constitutional law is that sometimes you can have a lot of lawyers involved in a process, and they can come up with a result that still doesn't necessarily completely pass constitutional muster, or runs into some difficulties. And I know Neil's going to talk about the Affordable Care Act, um, but think about all the lawyers who had input on that. All the del deliberation that went on there. Now, if you judged on the outcome, you'd say, well, it's kind of mixed. But the question kind of returns, what should be our criteria in assessing these things? I don't think it was for lack of deliberation that the outcome may have looked the way it did. Uh, it wasn't because people didn't take it seriously, even in Congress. So we've got to think about what might it be. Um, I have a couple possible answers, but let me at least give you a couple other things to think about before I give you those answers. Um, I think the way people look at the Constitution depends a great deal on their perspective. It's not a radical thought. But it should inform our judgment. I remember, for example, just to take one anecdote, um, I had the opportunity, um, the first day, it was the day after President Clinton's inauguration, and I had lunch with Ron Klain, somebody Chris knows well. Um, and he was in the White House Counsel's Office. And one of the things that was on the table at that point was had to do with war powers. And I remember saying to Ron at lunch, gee, how does that look to you now? Now, you have to remember, Ron used to be majority counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee. had spent a lot of time in the Senate. And his answer was, you know, it looks a lot different from where I sit right now. And that is the answer you get to a lot of constitutional questions. So if you look at Congress from the perspective of the executive branch, it looks one way. If you look at Congress from the perspective of the judiciary, it looks another way. If you look at them from your own perspective inside of them, they look a certain way. So one thing I want you to think about is what does it look from inside Congress? I don't think it's as simple as saying people just act in their self-interest. So I, 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 would, I know that's tempting to believe, 
but I think it's too simplistic and doesn't capture reality very well. So here's the other thing I want to think about, and here's um, something we might talk about. When we think of constitutional law, what do we think about? And I want to suggest to you it shouldn't just be judicial decision making, judicial decisions. My friend Mark Graber, at the University of Maryland, once said, and I agree with him in this regard, that if you actually think of the 50 most important events in constitutional law, very few are likely to come from courts. Most, in his judgment, came from Congress. And I want to suggest that I think he's right about that. So when the court sometimes makes decisions, the ones um, that sometimes have the most lasting significance are the ones that uphold what Congress does. So what does that tell us? But think about things like the National Bank, Social Security, Medicare, the Great Society, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, of course the Affordable Care Act. There are a lot of pieces of legislation that have gone through Congress that literally have shaped our constitutional world. And I'm going to suggest that I think members of Congress took the Constitution seriously when they considered those. That's just the 20th century. You can go back, I mean, I didn't mention the National Bank, you can go back to the 19th century and find other examples too. Um, and my point, of course, is that you're going to find that there's a lot of serious work done uh, on constitutional issues within Congress. And some of them, of course, do relate to what Chris was talking about. The, the nuclear option was something that um, was heavily debated, heavily considered. And I will tell you, not always well. But I think one thing that goes on in Congress is that members of Congress do have the opportunity to get counsel. And they get it from a lot of different sources and directions. So uh, for example, uh, this, the first example I'll give you will undercut my thesis. The other will reinforce it. But that's the way the world is. It's complicated. So I remember when I was testifying on the constitutionality of the, uh, the nuclear option several years ago in front of the Rules Committee. There was one point in which, um, and at that point I should tell you, I was the only Democratic witness, which, by the way, is how I often find myself in, in Congress. It's a lonely job. Somebody's got to do it. Um, and on the panel was a friend of mine named John Eastman, former Justice Thomas Clerk, very conservative. And John was talking about how unconstitutional it was. By the way, he was quite quiet later after the nuclear option was triggered. But one of the things that John talked about was how in the Senate there you could there was a rule, there was something called majority uh, rule. Um, and one of the things about majority rule, he said, is you can actually petition things out of a committee in the Senate by majority vote onto the floor. So in other words, majority controls everything. It's not true that things can die in committee. Majorities can get them out of there. And at that, at that moment, I thought to myself, I don't think that's right. And then Christopher Dodd was heading up the hearing, and he said, he turned around to people in the committee, which included Trent Lott, Bill Frist, among others, actually included five majority leaders. And he said, so what is the rule in the Senate? And the remarkable thing is not a single one of them knew. They had spent years and years in the Senate, and they didn't know the answer. I don't necessarily knock them too much for that because they were willing to ask the question. They were willing to acknowledge they didn't know the answer, which, by the way, is one of a great thing for a lawyer to be able to do. If you say, gee, I need information, help me find it. The answer is, actually, it's unanimous consent, which is different than majority rule. And so, uh, but the point is, both that they acknowledge some ignorance, and they actually were willing to look for an answer. And then they were willing to live with that answer. Uh, under those circumstances. Another quick story I'll tell you, which tries to illustrate, at least in an adult way, the extent to which members sometimes really do take the Constitution seriously. So now we're talking about something a little earlier. Um, we go back to the Line on Veto Act, 1997. Um, and in that circumstance, Congress obviously passed it. Um, and there were a lot of people who favored its constitutionality. President Clinton signed it into law. Uh, as fate would have it, I testified against it. Um, and because of that, won the undying affection of somebody named Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And so every time there was a development that related to the Line on Veto Act, I'd get a call from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Senator, no matter what I was doing. 
And I remember I was in Cleveland at this point, the dean of a law school. I was literally about to give a speech at the city club in Cleveland, which is a very special place. And somebody comes rushing up to me in the back and says, you got to take this phone call. It's an emergency. And I'm, OK, what is it? It's Senator Moynihan. And he wants to tell you what the Supreme Court just did in this case. So I had to literally delay. I, somehow he found me. And I literally go back. And he, of course, took the Constitution seriously. I tell you, he wasn't a lawyer. He uh, was a very thoughtful guy. Um, but to talk or think more systematically as I sort of bring this to a close, um, I, I want to caution you from overgeneralizing from not just anecdotes, as I've just done, but also overgeneralizing from particular episodes and thinking that broader picture that Mark Graber has challenged us to think about. To what extent has Congress fashioned our constitutional universe, fashioned the laws we live by, fashioned a lot of the constitutional principles we live by? And I would suggest that's not by accident. It is extraordinary to think those would have come out of, out of an institution, Congress, which was designed to be ineffective and inefficient. The default rule for Congress is to fail, not to get things done. So I don't think it's necessarily fail, fair to judge Congress on whether or not it gets things done. It may be fair to judge them on the basis of, OK, what is the quality of their deliberation? To what extent are they open to information? To what extent do they consider it as they are making decisions? And in that score, although I don't agree with the outcomes a lot, I actually think you'll find that Congress, more often than not, really does take the Constitution seriously. And as you study all these laws you study in law school or grapple with in your careers, you're going to find most of those things come from Congress. And if they do, you should th acknowledge that that's because they did take the Constitution seriously and nevertheless, or for good reasons, passed those laws. And now we live with them. I always think it's remarkable when Congress does anything right. I always think it's remarkable when Congress gets a law passed, when it actually does get things enacted. And that tells us something, too. I don't think it necessarily tells us that they're not taking the Constitution seriously or they're just sort of acting just in their self-interest. So I want to at least uh, take the risk of placing myself on the side that unbalanced, I think, members of Congress do take the Constitution seriously. That doesn't mean I always agree with them. But it does mean, I think, that they'll listen and that they hear the arguments. And now the question becomes, to what extent are they persuasive within the context of being a member of Congress? I think that's the critical question. Um, I think our history is filled with the answers. But I think we'll get even more illumination from Neil. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I, applaud, uh, I applaud you, Michael, for um, taking the more difficult <laughs> position and I would like to agree with it. Uh, and I think there's an important way in which I do and then an important way in which I don't. And so maybe I can uh, explain what I mean. I mean. What does it mean to take the Constitution seriously? I don't think it means only to respect constitutional limits. A lot of times we think of constitutionality and, and seriously considering constitutionality as just respecting limits on one's power. I think the Constitution doesn't just limit, it also empowers. The movement from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution was a movement to substantially expand the powers of the federal government because things were not going very well uh, before that expansion. And so when you talk about fashioning, and it's a great word, right? Uh, fashioning uh, the constitutional universe we live in, and you give the examples you do, I think we're in substantial agreement that the Constitution is a source of power and opportunities. It's also a source of inspiration on both the power side and the right side. And I think we're in substantial agreement that uh, the, uh, the Congress that passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is not just trying to achieve a policy objective. It's an act of legislative constitutionalism. Uh, and it's, it's a transformational statute that makes the promise of Brown begin to be somewhat real. So I think we're in agreement with that. Uh, but when it comes to the limit side, I think to take the Constitution seriously is also uh, a question of limits. Uh, and when I, look at the, um, when I look at the current Congress, uh, I see important instances in which, uh, in which I think there are cases of clear legal error, not just different perspectives, but clear legal error, instances in which Congress is inventing limits that don't exist, or Congress is ignoring limits that do exist. And I'll give you an example of each, uh, and each example uh, will take on right, uh, a different one of the two major 
political parties. So first, uh, the Affordable Care Act and constitutional objections within Congress to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there were actually a couple of constitutional points of order that Republican senators uh, uh, raised to the Affordable Care Act. And what do you know, they were straight party line votes. And all the Republicans thought not just that this, this bill was unwise, but that it was unconstitutional. And all the Democrats thought it was not only wise, it was also constitutional. Uh, and uh, none of the Republican senators seemed to feel the obligation to explain what had changed so radically in a decade. I mean, where did this idea of an individual mandate came from, come from? It came from conservative think tanks and Republican members of Congress a decade and a half earlier who proposed an individual mandate as an alternative to the Clinton health care plan. So the only consistency over time has been opposing Democratic proposals to reform health care. And the mandate went from being preferred to being not only unwise, but an unprecedented assault on the constitutional structure. Now, people change their minds. Uh, I have views about constitutionality that are not the same that they used to be. That's, that's, that's a possibility that we ought to seriously consider. But no one felt any obligation uh, to explain what accounted for the change in constitutional perspective over time. And what is more, this is what Senator Ensign said when, when he raised the constitutional point of order. Um, uh, and he argued that uh, he, he did it because uh, he thought that the bill uh, violated Congress's enumerated powers and uh, the Fifth Amendment takings clause of the Constitution. So he raised a takings clause problem and then didn't subsequently articulate what the takings clause problem was. Uh, and this is what he said. He says, anything we have ever done, somebody actually had to have an action before we could tax or regulate it. In this case, if you choose to not do something, in other words, if you choose not to get health insurance, this bill will actually tax you. It will act as an onerous tax. So for the first time in the history of the US, this bill will do something the federal government has never done before. And what I would suggest is that that is clear legal error. That is something about which reasonable people can't disagree. Now, what are you talking about, Siegel? You're intolerant. Didn't we just have this great national debate over the mandate? And we had a great national debate over the mandate about whether it falls within the scope of the Commerce Clause and whether Congress can require you under the Commerce Clause to buy a product from a third party that you don't want. There was no great national debate over whether Congress can do this under the tax power. The debate was whether or not this was, in fact, a tax. The Constitution expressly contemplates taxes on inactivity. They're called capitation taxes, head taxes, taxes on you by virtue of your existence. There is no plausible constitutional argument that Congress may not tax inactivity, which is why the objection the Chief Justice had to the mandate under the Commerce Clause was not one he had under the tax power. And it's why the four conservative justices in dissent at NFIB didn't, argue, didn't disagree with him about the tax power on that ground. Uh, so that's an example in which um, it seems to me that if you were taking the Constitution seriously, you'd want to account for why your view had changed so radically over time, if in fact it did, and what kinds of arguments are plausible to make about the law and what kinds of arguments are implausible. And if it's a case of clear legal error uh, and your constitutional objections are entirely consistent with your pro policy preferences and your ideological interests, it seems to me the fact that they're willing to hear the argument or entertain the perspective uh, doesn't suggest that uh, members are taking the Constitution seriously at all. OK, what about on the other side? And this is more recent. Remember back in March of 2011, and you had the budget impasse and the, right, the, uh, and the, government, uh, the government shutdown, and you had federal employees losing salary. Well, there were a number of senators uh, led by Democrats, led by Barbara Boxer, uh, who wanted uh, politicians to feel the pain, too. If they failed to get an agreement and the government shut down, it shouldn't just be federal employees. And so she proposed a bill that would uh, uh, withdraw the pay of the president as well as members of Congress for as long as the shutdown lasted until they got some kind of agreement going. It shouldn't just be employees who have fewer resources. This was supposed to be an incentive. It was supposed to be either a statement or a stunt, whatever it was. Well, there was a minor problem uh, with this proposal, which passed the Senate by unanimous consent. Actually, two minor problems, or one minor problem and two provisions of the Constitution. It is blatantly, emphatically, incontrovertibly, reasonable people can disagree about it, unconstitutional. 
Why? Well, this is what Article 2 says. It says, the, um, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 7, the President shall at stated times receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected. This is what the 27th Amendment says. Uh, no law varying the compensation for the services of senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. Now, if you think there are ways to reasonably disagree that that language could be read in such a way uh, as to uh, bless what Senator Boxer proposed and what the Senate approved by unanimous consent, I would like to hear them. What I would tell you is that this is one of those instances, relatively rare in my view, in which the constitutional text answers the question. Now, there were principled members of Congress, Senator Leahy, who raised the constitutional objection. He talked about Article 2. He didn't mention the 27th Amendment. Um, and what did Senator Boxer say in response? Well, she said, we're not reducing the president's salary. And Senator Leahy said, oh, yes, you are. So you, just, you can just deny reality. We're not reducing his salary. We're just taking money from him and never giving it back. Right? That's one thing she said. Another thing she said is that this is extraordinary circumstances. And then Senator Leahy said, well, that doesn't say anything about that in the Constitution. And the third thing she said was that, well, uh, no court has declared this unconstitutional. If the president disagrees, he can go to court which seemed to suggest a view that the Constitution is not violated until such time as a court says it's so. Uh, and here is where I want to connect this question of whether members take the Constitution seriously to the institution of judicial review. I right? guess well before Abner Mikva, uh, you had some famous constitutional scholars, uh, uh, Professor Thayer in the late 19th century, uh, who preached judicial restraint, uh, Alex Bickel, writing in the early 1960s, who uh, invoked uh, Thayer's views. One of the less well-known costs that some scholars have associated with robust judicial review is that it has the unfortunate side effect of um, causing members of Congress to absolve themselves of their own constitutional scruples, scruples. That there's a division of labor, it's for us to do what we want to do, and it's for the legislature, for the courts to determine whether what we've done is constitutional. Uh, and that it corrodes the constitutional integrity of the members of the legislature as well as the people more broadly. Now, it's hard to know whether empirically that has happened. It does seem to me impressionistically that constitutional debates in Congress about the National Bank were of substantially greater quality than constitutional debates in con Congress today. But there are other causes, uh, and it may be that judicial review is still so important that this is uh, an unfortunate so, uh, unfortunate side effect that we're willing to live with. I myself am no advocate of judicial restraint uh, across the board because I don't have enough faith in the democratic process to engage in the kind of constitutional deliberation uh, that um, I, I wish were the case. Uh, but but, but, but it, it, it may very well be uh, that we live in a world today in which uh, we so expect the courts to decide our constitutional questions for us that you have a member of Congress suggesting, notwithstanding what seems to me to be the plain text of two parts of the Constitution, that a constitutional violation doesn't come into being until such time as a court declares it so. So let me, uh, let me stop, uh, stop there. We have, uh, we have some time. Um, uh, do, do either of you want to respond to, uh, to one another or to me, or do you want to just open it up for, for questions? All right, great. Uh, let's hear from let's hear from you folks. There's a lot we've put we've put on the table. Yes. So for Daniel. a lot of American history, some of the most prominent Supreme Court advocates have been sitting members of Congress. I'm thinking people like Daniel Webster, Reverdy Johnson, you know, Augustus Garland, George Fort and Pepper, people like that. But I'm having trouble thinking of any recent examples. Um, so I'm wondering if this is just like a continuing coincidence or an emerging underwritten constitutional norm. And more generally, what do you think about that development? So, um, uh, it's a nice observation. Did, did I know Ted Cruz was SG of Texas? Right. Did he argue cases before the court? At least one, right? Uh, I mean, you know, it's an, it's, it's an interesting observation. I, I think that um, I'm not sure how much I draw out of it, though. You know what? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm disposed not to draw too many negative inferences on based on many things. Um, but I think that the nature of legal practice itself has changed. Supreme Court advocacy has changed. Now we've got you know firms and practices that are so focused on appellate advocacy in a way that it becomes almost a full time job. And um, and you know Webster argued over three hundred cases in the Supreme Court, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and um, I had gratuitously helped shape or fashion our constitutional world. Um, but um, 
so I, I don't know. I mean, I think you've got some people that have have um, certainly been law, you know practiced law, argued in courts. Uh, you know, uh, Richard Blumenthal, former Attorney General in Connecticut, um, former Supreme Court clerk. Um, I don't know to what extent he's argued in court, but my guess is he's. He has. I, yeah, you know, um, I worked on. Yeah, okay. I had one case where I think he was planning on arguing. Right. But it was not. It was not his typical fare. Right. So you've got some pretty able folks, so to speak, in terms of their backgrounds. But I think that um, maybe the other thing that's happened to some extent is you see people kind of go into one branch, and kind of they don't tend to go jump around as much. Maybe and Webster was back and forth and served uh, Secretary of State, several administrations. I mean, you know, the kind of things he did, are, you know, just can't be done anymore. And I think it's, that's part of the answer. I mean, it, it does, uh, one of the questions uh, that, that uh, Daniel, your observation raises for me is, uh, what are the costs and benefits of hyper-specialization? Yeah. We have a very specialized Supreme Court bar, and when you see folks, they're often state AGs who don't have a lot of experience arguing before the court, insisting that they're going to do it. Uh, it often doesn't go well. Uh, they're really not very able Supreme Court advocates. Uh, you see the justices themselves being hyper-specialized as former federal court of appeals judges, much fewer experiences elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the government. Uh, and um, uh, there are benefits to that, uh, but there are also, uh, particularly as the law becomes more technical, but I think there are also costs. I, I think Neil makes a great point. I mean, one thing you may recall from the Kagan Supreme Court hearings is some of the, is some of the little backlash there was, was, well, gee, she hadn't been a judge before, really. Um, but if you look at American history, slightly a majority of those people appointed to the Supreme Court actually were not judges. So that's an, uh, so they, some came from Congress and other places. So we, we've, that hyper-specialization, I think, is a phenomenon, and it's a kind of two-edged sword. Yeah. Yes? Um, do you think that this concept of Congress has gotten more and more partisan. There's been less respect for the Constitution. Do those two kind of go hand in hand, or? I think if you, uh, the House actually now has a rule that the Republican majority installed in 2010 that no bill can be introduced without a constitutional authority statement accompanying it. So the, the, uh, Sponsor of the bill has to state the basis in the Constitution that justifies the exercise of congressional authority. And if you look at the hearings of the House Judiciary Committee in this same period of time, a considerable number of them have been explicitly about constitutional issues. Uh, there is a concern, uh, I think you've probably read about the authorization the House gave to file a lawsuit against the president for failure to faithfully execute the laws. Well, that was preceded by a series of four or five hearings by the House Judiciary Committee on that topic. What does it mean to, what's the obligation of the president to faithfully execute the law? Can, can Congress sue about it, which raises a question of constitutional standing? Now, the Democrats tended to look at these hearings as gamesmanship. And when they participated, they would spend a lot of time just emphasizing that this was yet another unjustified attack on the president. Um, and it is an attack on the president. But ag again, you're back into the, my inability to distinguish between categories two and three. There are members of the House, I think, who firmly are convinced that the president, under their understanding of what it means to faithfully execute the laws, when the president instructs the Department of Homeland Security secretary to establish a blanket policy not to initiate deportation actions against um, minors and, and children who were brought here under, under conditions that would have qualified for the DREAM Act protection if the DREAM Act had been enacted. Congress doesn't enact that law, so the president does it by executive action. That, there's a legitimate constitutional issue that's been raised. Is it being advocated for partisan political purposes? Yeah. But are people advocating it because they actually sincerely also believe that they've discovered a president who's exceeding his constitutional bounds? I believe that a considerable number of the people on, uh, who are the sort of the spokesman for this position believe that. that they all, so both things are true at the same time. And the 
The friction's awfully high because of the partisanship. I don't think it necessarily means that the, that the Constitution is being taken less seriously. Uh, it just means that the shouting's louder <laughs> because it's the, the things that we read about and the issues that we notice members of Congress are arguing about tend to be the ones that also have some kind of political salience. So the press pays attention to them, the punditry pays attention to them, the cable shows pay attention to them. Terribly difficult to separate who's being insincere and just doing this because there's some political advantage to be made versus who's, there's an old saying, it's, it's a wonderful thing when principle and convenience come together. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing when what I sincerely believe to be the case is also to my political advantage to advocate. Those things do happen, and then it's very difficult to sort out whether one motive is dominating the other. Uh, so I think the partisanship contributes more to the visibility than it does explain either some ebb and flow in quality. There are other factors happening in, in and around the institution of Congress that may lead you to think that as a general matter, the quality of constitutional discourse is, is being degraded. Things like the shrinking calendar of periods of time in which committees actually meet and the House and the Senate are actually in session. The obligations that members feel to raise money uh, or to be back in their districts <coughs> talking to their district constituents so that they can secure re-election. All, all those things take away from the ability of the two bodies to do any kind of deliberation on anything. I mean, people have remarked that the number of serious policy conversations about hard questions of national importance uh, are very difficult to have in today's Congress. And the same would hold true of serious constitutional conversations. Can I just add one thing? Um, I know well enough not to disagree with anything Chris just said. <laughs> I, I would agree with it. But I just want to add one thing. And, and as to try not to make the mistake of thinking the only discussion deliberation goes on Congress is what happens on the floor. Mm. There's a lot of discussion deliberation goes on in all sorts of other ways. It just doesn't get recorded. Yeah. And so um, that's, I think that's part of the mix as well. Yep. It's something I, I wonder. Well, actually, I'll, I'll Sorry. I'd rather hear from you. Go ahead. Oh, um. Uh, sort of following on to that, to what extent then can we almost look at Congress like a court? Um, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats take, you know, plaintiff side and defendant <laughs> side, and they're and they're arguing about that. And you know, you can put whatever constitutional arguments you want if they're going to benefit your client, your position. Some of them, of course, aren't going to pass muster in an actual court situation, and those would be the ones that we hope actually don't get enacted. Um, you know, at the at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I myself wonder about uh, the relationship between, right, uh, the, when you ratchet up the partisanship, and you know, we didn't always have ideological parties. In fact, for most of the 20th century, we had non-ideological parties. You had real ideological disagreements within each of the two major parties. You had the, right, you had the liberal Republicans and the more conservative Republicans, and the same thing with the Democrats. Uh, the New Deal coalition was holding together conservative Southern Democrats and right, liberal Northern Democrats. Uh, now we have uh, right, uh, highly ideological uh, partisan parties, and I wonder uh, about what that changes. Uh, you, it seems to me people are more likely to acknowledge constitutional limits on what they want to uh, 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 what they want to achieve if maybe they're not the only ones doing that and they don't feel like schmucks for doing it, that other people do it. And maybe if there's more ideological diversity within the parties, you might see more of that. Something else that's striking to me about Congress and is not true of the other two branches is that Madison, when Madison talked about the separation of powers and the checks and balances, he talked about ambition counteracting ambition and how each branch would have its own kind of institutional esprit de corps. And what's striking is the executive, whether it's a, a Republican or a Democrat, the executive branch tends to stick up for the prerogatives of the executive branch, with few exceptions. And, and the justices and the federal courts, whether they're re appointed by Republicans or Democrats, they tend to stick, stick up for basic prerogatives of the judiciary. All nine justices believe in judicial supremacy. I don't see that at all in Congress. I, I see members very willing to trash their own institution, to over-argue just how limited the powers of the institution are, uh, 
if they really don't like what those with more votes are about to achieve. And I wonder uh, what causes that, and uh, is it really we have more of a separation of parties phenomenon than a separation of powers phenomenon that Congress is just very different as a result? Yeah. It's just a, a, one possible answer to the very valid observation that Congress doesn't stick up for its own interests. And it was put in a pithy way by George Mitchell when he was retiring from the Senate, the senator from Maine, who was one of the majority leaders during his term. Uh, he was commenting on how little respect members of the institution have for uh, the institution itself. And he said, well, as many people have noted, one of the best arguments in favor of being elected is that the institution is lousy and I'm going to go to Washington and change it. And everybody takes that position, whether you're the incumbent or the challenger. And you attack the other person for their complicity in the institutional dysfunction that we all observe. Or you say you're the or if you're the incumbent, you tend to attack the other part, person on the basis of their qualifications to do anything about it. And most campaigns get to be pretty nasty uh, and filled with negativity to the extent to which one side is, uh, one person's attacking, well, wait, wait, Mitchell put it, it says, if you have a political campaign and one side's calling the other guy a rogue and the, that guy's calling the other person a crook, why is it any surprise that everybody thinks that Congress is filled with rogues and crooks? <laughs> and no one wants to defend that. No one wants to defend the cesspool that is the Congress. So um, that's an explanation, I think, for why, um, plus, this, um, plus what I mentioned earlier, this, uh, this um, shrinking of the sense of obligation to pay a port important important part of your mission as a member of Congress is to deliberate, be a hardworking committee member, stay in town in order to solve problems. The emphasis is so much on re-election, getting back to the district to show your presence in town hall meetings or raising the money it takes to run campaigns. There's very little internal incentive to defend the institution with most members of Congress. And so they don't. So that, and that sounds like that phenomenon transcends um, the level of partisanship that a lot of people perceive today. Yeah, that's um, been going on for right. preceding this period of intense polarization that we're in. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So going on to that, if, if we've been looking at Congress as a whole, but given that one of the chambers is elected every two years and the other every six, do you find that the chamber treats the Constitution differently, that maybe the Senate Judiciary Committee approaches it from a different vantage point as the House, given the dynamics of each chamber? That's a really good question, excellent question. Um, and I'm not sure I've thought about it in those terms enough to... Top of the head, my inclination is to say no. Um, that the, the differences in election cycle wouldn't necessarily... It's not immediately apparent to me how that would affect their consideration of constitutional questions. But I, I should have stopped first. I hadn't... I haven't... A great question. I hadn't thought about it before in those terms. I will give it some thought. I mean, briefly, I would just say, you know, consider the fact that with the legislative branch, there's so many much, so many, so many more forces that are at work on it than either of the other two branches, not to mention the fact it wasn't created to be monolithic or unified. In fact, literally, it's designed to be bicameral, among other things. Um, so it's, and I don't think we can lose sight of that in trying to figure out how to analyze what Congress does. It's, um, the other thing I want to map onto that um, that's maybe worth thinking about is, Consider what each member believes his or her job to be. You know, something to, to think about is what's the duty or obligation or agency function of a member of Congress? You may find the members of Congress don't agree with each other about that. But given what Chris said, it, it could well be that one of the things that does happen, of course, is that because of the, the need for substantial amounts of money to get reelected, you know, reelection ends up perhaps occupying maybe a bigger part of their awareness than maybe it used to. Um, but they may think, for example, my job is to just t do what the constituents tell me to do. Now, you could d dispute that and say, well, yeah, well, is that always in the best interest of the institution? The answer is probably not, but that's a different conception of the job. So what you may find with 535 people is hundreds of different 
conceptions of what their jobs are, which may also help to explain on top of everything else Chris said why it looks so inefficient. All right. Well, I think uh, we will leave it. We will leave it at that. And I want to thank. I want to thank you, Michael, and thank you, Chris, and thank all of you for being with us today. <laughs> Happy Constitution Day.